Genital herpes in pregnancy. Uh, genital herpes infection in general has been rising in uh, prevalence in developed countries and in UK. And neonatal infection is a consequence of uh, genital herpes. Uh, also, neonatal herpes is rare in UK. Its incidence is uh, rising over years. And this is due to the rise in the prevalence of sexual transmitted infection, uh, as well as social changes within general population, and the improvement in the diagnostic techniques. Neonatal herpes, also, it's rare, but it's very serious, with high morbidity and mortality. We classify it into uh, three subgroups, depending on the site of infection. It can be either disease localized to the skin, eye, and or the mouth, or localized to central nervous system, which is encephalitis alone, or disseminated infection. And disseminated infection has multiple organ involvement. So if the disease is localized to the skin, eye, or the mouth, these infants have the best prognosis. It's approximately 30% of neonatal herpes infection. And with appropriate treatment, the neurological and ocular sequel is less than 2%. If the disease is localized to the CNS, which is encephalitis, or disseminated, the risk of morbidity and mortality is high. It was found that 70% of infants who have disseminated infection or CNS infection and 60% of infants with local CNS will present without skin, eye, or mouse infection. Those who present with local CNS disease often present late, uh, between 10 days and 4 weeks of age. And even with appropriate antiviral treatment, the mortality will be around 6%, and neurological morbidity will be about 70%. And unfortunately, this neurological morbidity will be lifelong. Disseminated disease has a worse prognosis. Uh, as even with antiviral treatment, the mortality will be around 30% and the neurological complication will be around 17%. This describes the importance of understanding the pathogenesis behind genital herpes in pregnancy and uh, prevention of transmission. We all know that neonatal herpes is caused by one of two types, either herpes simplex virus type 1 or herpes simplex virus type 2. And the incidence is almost equal, 50% each. Most of the cases occur as a result of direct contact with infected maternal secretion. And in 25%, postnatal transmission is blamed for the infection, usually as a result of orolabial herpes infection. So what are the factors affecting the transmission? The factors is the type of maternal infection, whether it is a primary infection or a recurrent infection. So we know that if the woman acquires a new infection, which is a primary genital herpes, within six weeks before delivery, the risk of infection is very high to the neonate, and this is because the viral shedding is very high and the immunity is not yet developed because the protective maternal antibody doesn't pass to the baby at this time. Presence of transplacenta neutralizing antibody Duration of rupture of membrane before delivery The longer the duration of rupture of membrane, the more the neonate is at risk of disseminated infection and the, as he is more exposed to high viral load and we know that disseminated herpes is more common in preterm and exclusively as a result of primary infection We know also that transplacental acquired herpes simplex virus antibody don't prevent herpes virus spreading the brain of the unit. Disseminated herpes may present with encephalitis, hepatitis, disseminated skin lesion, or combination of these conditions. It's rare in adults, however, it has been more commonly reported in pregnancy. Also, the use of fetal scalp electrode and the mode of delivery affect the risk of transmission. That's why, as we will say later, in primary genital herpes, mode of delivery recommended will be a cesarean section. Oh. 
We will speak first at the primary genital herpes infection in pregnancy and we will classify it into two main categories. Either the infection happened in first and second trimester or infection happened in third trimester. So if the infection happened in the first or second trimester, we know that there is no increased risk of spontaneous miscarriage. There is no increased risk of congenital malformation and still the woman is away from delivery and accordingly we need to manage the woman first by referring her to genital urinary medicine in order to confirm or refuse the diagnosis by viral shedding polymerase reaction test and advice on further management we need to screen uh, other sexual transmitted infections we shouldn't delay treatment and the management should be in line with her clinical condition usually we use oral acyclovir in a standard dose which is 400 mg 3 times daily for 5 days because cyclovir will lead to re reduction in duration as well as severity of symptoms also it is not licensed in pregnancy but it's safe and is not associated with any increase in birth defects the only a reported side effect is transient neonatal neutropenia but it is of no clinical significance and then from 36 week we have to give the woman a suppressive dose which is 400 mg 3 times daily till delivery because this will reduce the risk of herpes simplex virus lesion at term and accordingly it will reduce the need to deliver by cesarean section Needless to say, you need to treat women symptomatic by providing her analgesics, paracetamol, topical lidocaine and as we said here, vaginal delivery is the recommended mode because we are still away from 6 weeks before delivery So if infection happened in 3rd trimester, we know that the risk of neonatal herpes will be up to 41% The risk of increase preterm labor as well as low birth weight insufficient evidence to suggest the association between herpes simplex virus and stillbirth again we should treat the woman in the same lines as if infection happened in the first or second trimester in terms of referral to genital urinary medicine uh, screen for asexual transmitted infection uh, give her acyclovir and symptomatic management using paracetamol and topical lidocaine as well as suppressive dose from 36 weeks but here the only as if primary herpes occur in third trimester especially in the last six weeks before delivery the mode of delivery is cesarean section because there is a high risk of transmission to the baby so for recurrent genital herpes uh, it's the same rule apply as the primary one so the counseling and the referral to a gum clinic is a cyclovir um, and uh, analgesics uh, with paracetamol as well as topical lidocaine and again we have to give suppressive dose of acyclovir from 36 week but here because it's recurrent infection so the risk of neonatal herpes is 0 to 3 percent and accordingly vaginal delivery can be uh, the mode of delivery in her situation without the need for resilient section However, the patient needs to be counseled uh, properly about the risk of neonatal herpes that even if it's rare, it still exists. It has been reported that uh, the invasive procedure like fetal blood sampling, fetal scalp electrode, uh, artificial rupture of membrane or instrumental delivery increase the risk of neonatal infection. However, because the background risk is very small, it's 0 to 3% as I said before, and the increased risk associated with these procedures is still unlikely to be clinically significant so it can be used if needed but the woman should be counseled properly about uh, all these steps if, if genital herpes is diagnosed at the time of delivery if it is a primary herpes therefore the cesarean section will be the mode of delivery intravenous acyclovir can be given intrapartum to the mother in a dose of 5 mg per kilogram every 8 hours and subsequently to the neonate as well uh, as intravenous acyclovir 20 mg per kilogram every 8 hours if the woman opt for vaginal delivery it's still unknown whether the intrapartum acyclovir reduce the risk of neonatal infection or not 
Women should be counseled that the risk of urinary infection if primary herpes it will be up to 41%. And this risk will be higher even with invasive procedures like fetal scalp electrode, fetal blood sampling, or instrumental delivery. That's why these measures should be completely avoided. If rupture membrane is more than 4 hours, still the cesarean section carry a benefit and it still can be recommended as a mode of delivery. Also, the risk of infection become higher at this point. However, we still need to offer head the section. However, in case of recurrent infection, the situation is different, so vaginal delivery can be achieved. Invasive procedure is controversial as before, also it increases the risk, but the background risk is very rare, it's 0 to 3%. Therefore, the increase in risk is clinically insignificant and it can be done if needed but the women need to be adequately counseled. And the same, we know that the longer duration of rupture membrane, the higher the risk. So we need to expedite delivery if rupture membrane happens. In case of preterm pre labor rupture membrane, the situation is a bit uh, difficult at this moment for the decision, especially with primary infection. So there must be a multidisciplinary team which involves obstetrician, neonatologist, and urinary medicine. And the management will depend on gestational age. If decision is made for immediate delivery, therefore the cesarean section carries a benefit and should be recommended. However, if we have to go for conservative measures, therefore intravenous acyclovir should be given at a dose of 5 mg per program every 8 hours. Prophylactic corticosteroids can be given how to reduce the implication of preterm labor. And if delivery is indicated within 6 weeks of primary infection, cesarean section is the recommended mode of delivery. In case of recurrent infection, expectant management can be achieved till 34 week gestation. And we have to give the one or a for 100 mg three times daily. If the woman has both HIV and herpes simplex virus, therefore we need to follow the guidelines for HIV. And we need to give the woman suppressive dose of acyclovir from 32 weeks. However, the management will follow the HIV guideline regarding the mode of delivery and the treatment. For the new needs, so if the baby is born by cesarean section, we know that there is a very low risk of vertical transmission. Therefore, conservative management is recommended, in which we have to liaise with the neonatal team. Uh, swaps is not indicated. No active treatment is required. Just normal postnatal care of the baby is advised with neonatal examination at 24 hours of age and after which the baby can be discharged if well and no problem and the parent should be educated regarding the good hygiene, uh, seek, med seek medical help if there's any concern. Uh, in particular, uh, they have to look for the skin, for the eye, mucous membrane lesion, lethargy, irritability or poor feeding. So if the baby is born by a vaginal delivery in women with a primary genital herpes, we know that the risk of infection can be up to 41%. That's why here we have two scenarios. The first scenario, if the baby is well, we still need to investigate to do swab of the skin, genitiva, oropharynx, and the rectum. But lumbar puncture is not necessary. We have to give intravenous acyclovir and follow the strict infection control procedures. Breastfeeding is allowed but parents should be warned to report any early signs of infection. But on the other hand side, as baby is born unwell, in this case we need to do the swaps, we need to have the lumbar puncture, and we need to give intravenous acyclovir 20 mg per kg every 8 hours. At any point, if there is neonatal concern, we have to liaise with the neonatal team, we have to consider bacterial sepsis and herpes simplex virus infection, Surface swaps and blood should be sent for herpes simplex virus culture and PCR. Intravenous acyclovir should be started while awaiting the results. So not to wait for the result, we have to start the intravenous acyclovir, acyclovir while we are waiting. And further management will depend on the condition of the baby. Hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.